Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video, as you requested, we're going to be examining Macbeth as a tragic figure. We're going to unpack what exactly the qualities of a tragic figure are in accordance to the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. We're then going to be examining the evidence across the play and then I'll be handing it right back to you to consider in your own independent practice exactly what you consider to be the hallmarks of this character and whether he fits the bill. So hit subscribe, join my tribe, and let's get into it. So we're drawn to the attention of Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosopher, who wrote, if you like, the dictionary of what a great tragedy was in ancient times. And he talks about how tragic heroes had similar qualities across all plays to evoke the right levels of pity and fear that would shock audience into action. And so On Poetics is that book, and I'm just going to run you through three of the characteristics that are often referenced by students, but often misused in analysis. I'm going to kick off with the first quality. Hamartia is that first quality. It's essentially the error of a tragic hero or a character flaw that they have that leads to them failing. Now, oftentimes in analysis, students will say, well, he's so weak-willed, he follows his wife. That isn't an enough for someone like Aristotle. He's talking about something inherent within the person in their own choices. If you like, ambition could well be the flaw or error in the Christian society within which this play was written. When he says in Act 1, Scene 4, stars hide your fires, let not light see my deep and dark desires, what he's referencing with that wonderful light and dark contrast is that he is fueled by what the witches have just told him, which is that his future is to be king, but he just can't wait. So in a sense, his hamartia is his inability to be patient. His hamartia is also his ambitions that are unwieldy. The next quality of a tragic hero, as Aristotle saw it, was that they had a sudden reversal of fortune. That would be the plotted version of them, now, in terms of what that looks like in our play, the moment that Macbeth doubts the decision to kill Duncan at the end of Act One is proof that he will have this unexpected reversal of fortune. Though it's inevitable in Act Two when we see the decline in his own mental health around the fact he's murdered Duncan, but then the icing on the cake is not in Act Five. It's in Act Three, Scene Three. When Banquo dies, his last words to his son Fleance, who escapes, are revenge. And to some extent, that surely fuels our understanding that Macbeth, in Act 3, Scene 4, seeing the ghost of his friend, is fearful. Is that the start of an unexpected reversal of fortune, or is it just pure terror? The third feature that Aristotle holds dear to a tragic hero is that of anagorisis, this critical moment, if you like, a light bulb moment of discovery where they recognise what's happening and what they have done. For Macbeth, this happens in Act 5, Scene 5, when that revelation is shared that Macduff was untimely ripped from his mother's womb. This is in line with what the witches had warned him, that he would be killed at the hands of a man who was not born of woman. And the woods moving and the trees moving, this is all what they had told him. But he interprets their last prophecy as, in some respects, how invincible he is. But now we meet the real challenge between Aristotle and Shakespeare in the tragedy they carve out. For Aristotle, a man cannot become a hero until he can see the root of his own downfall. Yet this is not in line with Shakespeare. For Shakespeare, a character can be doomed from the start, not responsible for their flaw, but responsible for their actions. If you like, Macbeth is a leader of men. His a fate affects the nation. If you like, greatness to nothing, hero to zero. But Shakespeare has sympathy for a villain who kills a monarch. We now need to dig deeper and establish to what extent we have to judge the character Macbeth and then apply the qualities that Aristotle has and then carve out our own judgment. Let's go. 
we're first alerted to Macbeth as brave in Act 1, Scene 2, when the captain is retelling to King Duncan the virtue of this warrior. For brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name. Now our judgment is now cast on Macbeth as someone who is virtuous because he has killed in the name of the king. But let's just hold back a second. If we step back and look at the cold light of the facts, to what extent is this definitely virtue? It's still killing. And to some extent, it's honour killing, but it's still killing. The next character who offers us an insight into Macbeth's character is Lady Macbeth, when she's reading the letter from her husband where he narrates the promotion that King Duncan has given him to Thane of Cawdor. Very ironic, of course, because the last Thane of Cawdor is hung as a traitor and killed very dramatically, and of course, Macbeth will soon be a traitor too. When she describes him as too full of the milk of human kindness, the feminising qualities of referring to him as kind and using the analogy of milk is one thing, but her view of what kindness is seems very distinctly different to us as audience members as the play unfolds. To what extent we judge each of these characters that relays Macbeth's qualities for us to determine if he is truly a tragic hero, we need to establish to what extent he is genuinely aware of his weakness for himself. When we first meet Macbeth in Act 1, Scene 3, we are struck by how much he wants the witches to tell him more in their prophecy. He says, stay, you imperfect speakers, tell me more. And this telling him more is something that he is desperate to find out. It leads him on to do bad things, you may say, but it also speaks volumes of his genuine weakness. Is it ambition? Is it ego? It's for you to decide. But at the heart of our investigation, we have to examine the reality. He kills the king. And in some respects, Shakespeare means for us to challenge that. Shakespeare is questioning in his tragedies big questions that provoke huge responses from us. The central question of every tragedy, like every disaster, is why did this have to happen? When we try and answer this, we need to think in terms of that tragic flaw. Yet, I have to be honest, overemphasis on a tragic flaw can narrow our vision of a Shakespearean tragedy. For one thing, it blames the victim for their misery, and then it underplays our sympathy, ruining the pity that Aristotle thought was one of the two major effects of a tragedy, that and creating terror and shock in an audience. Where Shakespeare differs from Aristotle is that whilst Aristotle declared tragedy involving unmerited misfortune, Shakespeare over the course of his career makes protagonists more and more responsible for their own catastrophe. We move away from heroes such as Romeo and Juliet, who seem quite innocent, to those that seem much more clearly responsible for settling into the motion the forces of destruction that are in their grasp. Villains as heroes are cast in the form of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. How can we possibly sympathise with a tragic figure who's an outright criminal? Defying the divine right of kings? Aristotle thought we couldn't, but Shakespeare definitely did. But to what extent is Macbeth just a victim of evil influences? One theory is that tragic heroes are just scapegoats. They're blamed for representing a corrupt element of society's ills. This certainly seems true for Macbeth, who serves to practically cure Scotland's ills upon his death. All of the nation's problems are gone by the end of the play, it would seem, and that just frees us to think that there's credibility in that argument. Now, I just want to leave you with one other thought. We meet Macbeth at the start of the play, and he shows evidence to us of being quite troubled. But your depiction of him as a tragic figure or not hinges on your interpretation of him at the start and then by the end of the play. Does he show any remorse? Over to you. Here is the question I'd love for you to answer in the comments section below. You have until 4pm this afternoon, that's live on the 24th of March 2020, if you want live feedback mark from me. If not, just 
reply in the comment section. I'd love to know what you think. Thanks for watching and don't forget to hit subscribe.